As you know, that this is a <coughs> part of the Big Read, which is a project sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Muse Institute of Museum and Library Services and Arts Midwest to encourage people to read. Um, the idea is that in each city takes a book by an American writer and focuses a program around it. And we, were, the Mercantile Library was the sponsor of the project here and has focused this around um, Washington Square. And some of you may have seen this. I don't know whether there's copies here in the library or not. Uh, this is the schedule of the events, most of which are over now. But I do want to mention that this Saturday here, they're going to do a reading of Washington Square, the play. And it's being done by a, a, a group called the Metropolitan Playhouse. And it's a, a company down on West Fourth, East 4th Street that focuses on American plays and plays about American culture and history. And it's an extremely interesting company. And I've seen this production twice. And I can really recommend it to you. The woman pairing Catherine Sloper is exceptional. And what's most interesting is she's the right age. Yeah. And she is, you know, 22, 3, 4, 5, something like that. And the other thing that's interesting, it's, it's very well acted, extremely well acted. And the other thing that's interesting is that the father's an American. And it changes the whole, you know, when you have Ralph Richardson and Albert Finney, mm -hmm. it's an English father being an English father. And this man is an American, being an American father. And it's quite a different experience. So if you can come to that. And then I just want to mention that um, uh, there's a tour, Henry James's New York, on Sunday the 26th, which is uh, about Washington Square. That's sold out, but they're going to do a third one. So if you call to the number that's here. And then finally, um, uh, the, the, so there's a Barnes & Noble event. And then at the Merchant House Museum, John Barrett, who wrote Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, who adores this novel, is going to read his favorite passages from it and talk about it. But if you get a chance, you can look at this and see the uh, various things that have taken place. Is that, are you having, is anybody having trouble hearing me? Just tell me. If it, you lose me, Raise your hand because I, every word I say is a pearl and I don't want you to <laughs> lose a single one of them. Um, I, I should say to you that um, the last full book that I wrote was researched and written in this library. And it, it, is, a, it is a biography of an American poet. And the biography is called Who is Witter Binner? A biography because I worked on it and every time I told somebody I was working on the biography of Witter Binner, they would say to me, well, who is Witter Binner? So that's how it got that name. And I won't bother you with who Witter Binner is. <laughs> um, I'm going to lead you through a, a kind of interpretation of Washington Square that, that, that might, to a certain degree, surprise you. Um, uh, at least I hope it does in some of the points. But uh, what I think is a very valid interpretation. Um, I begin in London in 1876. In December, James moved from Paris, where he had been for a year, to London. And that began his so-called permanent residence abroad. Um, he had thought that that residence was going to be in Paris because he really admired far more of the Parisian, the French writers, than he did the English writers. But he, like Sargent and Whistler, moved from Paris to London. And we could stop on that point and say if, if it was always a very positive gesture in each of their cases. Um, but at any rate, in James's case, it was an affirmation of his English heritage and a feeling of associating with it. And he began his very extensive career there. And right after he moved, Roderick Hudson was published, and then the American, and then um, the Europeans. and. In 78, right before he wrote Washington Square, Daisy Miller, which was a sensation uh, both on, uh, in England and in the United States. And if any of you are interested, you really ought to get a hold of a short story he wrote as a kind of companion piece to it called um, An International uh, Episode, which is really a fascinating account of two English people coming to New York 
and what's done with it. Have any of you read it, have you? Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. It's a very, very interesting comparison piece in World War III. When he was in England, he became very social. And people have made a lot of fun of that, but it was, in a way, it was just sort of Henry James. It's very important to remember that Henry James is, in my estimation, the greatest American writer. And certainly in terms of the entire output, I mean, you know, 20 plus novels, 100 plus short stories, for, well, what will end up being innumerable volumes of letters, travel pieces, criticism, and so forth, no one has in the French sense of oeuvre like James is. And what is most amusing is no American writer has had so many of his novels made into movies as Henry James has. Um, but he is a funny man. And it's very important to have a sense of humor about Henry James and not take him too seriously, as I think people are wont to do. And he went out to dinner a lot. And he met a woman, <clears throat> I'm not sure in England or in America, by the name of Fanny Kimball, which might be a name that you know. She was from a very great acting family. And um, she told him a story, a, what he called a dome, a given, and which was about her brother, who had courted the daughter of the provost of King's College, Cambridge, and wanted to marry her. She was an heiress. And the father didn't like it, and said, if you marry that man, you'll not get a penny from me. And uh, the man jilted her. That was Fanny Kimball's brother. And the woman, the young woman, came to Fanny and asked for her help, although there was little she could do. So she told this story to Henry James. What is interesting is that here is Henry James establishing himself in England, being given a very English situation. And he immediately transfers it to New York City of his childhood. Now that's a point I'm going to just leave because I'll come back to that at the end. But I think it's a very important point. It's worth <clears throat> being a little bit to remember that Fanny Kidden was from an acting family, very famous one. She was a brilliant actress when she came to America. She met a man named Pierce Butler, a Philadelphian who was <clears throat> very, very, very wealthy. And um, after she married him, she discovered that his wealth came from uh, the slave plantations off the Carolina coast, and she, where she was taken to live. And she wrote a devastating account of it, which was very against slavery, causing a great deal of trouble, naturally, with her husband. She produced an heir, a female, and then divorced the man and went back to England. The heir, interestingly enough, married a writer by the name of Owen Wister, who wrote The Virginian, as some of you may know. But what is particularly interesting is some of the best early criticism of James's late novels was written by Owen Wister. So it's a, it's a kind of a little uh, bit of a literary circle here. Um, but she became Fanny Kimball. Um, the kind of close friend that most of us associate Edith Wharton as being. But remember, Edith Wharton didn't even come into James' life until 1904, and he died in 1916. Before it was Fanny Kimball, who was many years older than James, and there was also Catherine Fen uh, Wilson, whom some of you may have read about as well. Washington Square is structured in an interesting way. It's a series of encounters, almost like scenes in a play, and it's limited to, and it all takes place in a parlor, in a house. It is very domestic, and I'll come back to that, with really four main characters and two lesser ones. But there's hardly another person, you know, the, the, that appears in this whole kind of thing. The house is actually James's grandmother's house. And he, when he describes the house in the novel, and it sort of moves out, some of you may have noticed. It's almost as though he forgot that he was writing a novel, but he describes the actual house in which his grandmother lived and which he went as a very young man. <clears throat> I think what is important about all of that is that this is a very family-related novel. It is essentially a family drama. In fact, some people, including Leon Adele, have seen Catherine as representing Henry James and Sloper as representing his domineering and critical brother, William. Um, and that, 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 in fact, Adele says, 
she, Catherine is an image of himself as victim of his brothers and America's failure to understand either his feelings or his career. We don't have to be sure we believe that, um, but let's just think about it for as we go through talking, and you'll understand why we'll come back to that. <coughs> There's a lot of threads that I'm going to try to weave all together right at the end, as Catherine does. You see, so you'll have to hope that I do that. Well, I have to hope that I do that. <laughs> um, someone else has spoken of James as um, as Alice James as being Catherine, and. Um, that Dr. Sloper is being Henry James Sr. Um, that doesn't seem to me to matter one way or the other, but I think the thing that matters is there's always been a persistent effort to try to not only have this be a family drama, but tie it to the James family, and even particularly to Henry. You all know, but I just want to mention that there have been the, 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 the play, The Heiress, which I mentioned before, which was on Broadway, and most recently was on Broadway with Charity Jones, and I would imagine a number of you might have seen that production, which was a great production. Uh, two movie versions. <coughs> the first was with Olivia de Havilland, Ralph Richardson, Montgomery Cliff, and Marion Hopkins, and that was in 49. And the second in, um, 80s, in, in um, 97, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee, Albert Finney, Ben Chaplin, and Maggie Smith, a, a very controversial film um, with, with, which took a lot of liberties, but has uh, two, um, I think, very convincing elements in it. And, and one is that there is real feeling between Catherine and Morris in that film. And there's a real drama between the father and Morris which is much stronger than it is in the other film. And, and you feel things in a, in a different kind of a way. Um, one final mark here on, on the sort of background. James, as you know, wrote in 1907-08 and did, edited an edition of his works. And he spent a great deal of time doing this, and it was to be a sort of magnum opus and the confirmation of what he thought he was as a writer. And at this point, the public it was pretty much denying him. And, his three great novels that are admired so much now were not admired at all. And um, he unfortunately rewrote some of these things in a way that is not really successful. The originals are better. But the point for us which is interesting is these some 20 odd volumes, I'm not sure what the number is, I think it's 22, 23, 24. He left out of them all of his American work. The Europeans is not there, Washington Square is not there, and the Bostonians is not there. And the only American short story is The Jolly Corner, which you may or may not have read, but I'm going to refer to um, <coughs> that uh, again later on. I think this is very interesting. Why would he um, choose to eliminate all of this American thing, and yet he calls it the New York edition. That's the name on the page. Um, again, I'm trying to create a, a sense of, of, if you want, curiosity about this novel, which I think underlies it in a very, and, and it's ambiguous, but a very important way. James, one final remark. It is to remember that in writing, James was interested in the fine reader. He said, someone on whom nothing is lost. It's the Jamesian ideal. And it's the ideal in the character as it is in the reader. James is interested in the person of fine sensibility. In other words, just, just take Portrait of a Lady, which so many have, have read. And what he's interested in Isabel is the way in which she, can, she sees and conceives of the world. And in the great chapter in that novel is the chapter where she sits in front of the fire for the entire night and goes over in her mind, having seen her husband and Madame Merle in a conversation that is too intimate. And she tries, she, she tries to put, to use this fine mind. Well, this is very important, I think, in getting to James. Um, because what James saw as usually limiting this fine mind was the 
where people came to a situation with a fixed perspective or a fixed point of view, a predisposition, something in advance. For example, coming to examine a situation and say, it's wrong to blank, rather than coming to the situation and saying, all right, it's this and this and this and this. And how do we place those together and how do we bring out of it the greatest opportunity? Now, some people have traced this sort of vision of James's to a sort of a, a, a kind of sense of, of, of his as an American, and his as a believer of democracy, and the idea that there are all these different viewpoints that have to play and have to be dealt with and to accept it. Other people have seen the relationship of this idea to the empiricism and the pragmatism of William James, um, which is, was very much that the, the moral situation arises from the context rather than from some preconceived idea. Now, I will say to you right away that the present pope is opposing this concept very seriously, and he feels that it is undermining the, the system of Roman Catholicism as he believes it should exist. And I would say to you that probably he is absolutely right um, in, in, the, in the, his opinion about that. Um, William James and Henry James might suggest that maybe there was a more, if you want, a more complicated and, and a proposition to be dealt with in dealing with this. But if we keep this in mind, we realize that as readers, what we're looking for is the opportunity to begin to um, see what are the elements in this novel that have a sort of predisposed theoretical situation. And it doesn't take much to realize it's the social structure of New York in the 1840s, in which there is a young man who is supposed to succeed, that is the one who's marrying the girl, who is, you know, got the job, working hard, buying a house, and then going to keep it for four years and move uptown because everybody moves uptown. And he's seen as the ideal, the pragmatic, very uh, authoritative, very clear father who's a very good doctor, and as we'll talk about in a minute, very good, but loses, he's unable to.